State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit papajohns.com today for more info. Hello and welcome to another episode of Third Down Chirp delivered by Papa John's. Hopefully everyone had a good Halloween vacation over the weekend. Uh, guys, we're still recovering. Pat Boylan and Chris Rankle from that big shootout this weekend up at Western Michigan. It's just good that the scoring slowed down the second half or we might not have made it back here. <laughs> the only thing scarier than the game on Halloween weekend was that weather. What was up with yeah. that? Rain, sun, cold, hot, I don't know. Yeah, it was very interesting. Let's actually take a look at some of the highlights. There were plenty in a 45-35 to 35 game. The Cardinals have had success in Kalamazoo. They've won the last three straight, but it was all Broncos early. Alex Carter to Jordan White on the very first drive of the game. He would scamper to the end zone for a 40-yard play. But the Cardinals not going away early. Juwan Edwards barreling his way into the end zone the other way. The drive next drive back for the Cardinals to tie it. Then second quarter. Barrington Scott gets in for the Cardinals. They take the lead 14 to 7. But Western fighting back Robert Arnheim with a beautiful diving catch there from Alex Carter from three yards out, 14 all. Then Robert Arnheim with a little trick play and the treat to Mr. White once again, this time for 61 yards as he goes all the way to the end zone. He had two touchdowns on the day. And Western not done there in the second quarter. Seven total touchdowns combined in the second quarter. This one's Tevin Drake, a bunch of missed tackles there as they get into the end zone up 28 to 14. Late in the second half, this one goes to Briggs Orsbond from Keith Wenning, his first touchdown of the day with 52 seconds to go. And then Western pushing it back the other way before the half. An unforced error there is Josh Howard with the interception and the Cardinals Keith Wenning will find Briggs Orsbond once again over the middle with eight seconds to go. The Cardinals close in at half, only trailing 35 to 28. But Alex Carter the other way in the second half, right up the middle, not even touched 48, 42 rather, to 28. And the Cardinals really a last chance drive here as they get it to Jack Tomlinson for the touchdown. So closing in, the Cardinals were down seven after that. Western got a field goal, so the Cardinals were down 10. Keep the one in rolling out on fourth down, looking for someone inside the 10, and the ball gets knocked away. It was fumbled into the end zone by rule. You can't advance that uh, on fourth down there. So that pretty much wrapped up the games. The Cardinals do lose by 10, 45 to 35. Let's take a look at the final uh, stats. Uh, what kind of sticks out in your guys' mind? Well, you look at Jordan White, the six-year senior, nine receptions, 172 yards, two touchdowns, just continuing to shred this Ball State secondary. And another good game for Briggs Orsbon. Ten catches, 103 yards, and two scores. Looks like he's finally getting going. His first ever surprisingly two-touchdown game uh, as a Ball State Cardinal. Let's hear from Coach Lembo after the game. I know we were a little aggressive on offense at times, going for it on fourth down. Uh, a couple times where maybe we could have took a shot at a field goal. Of course, it was really windy. So that factored a little bit into our thinking. But the other thing was, quite frankly, uh, I felt like we needed to be aggressive and take some shots to keep drives alive and come away with seven points because we were having trouble slowing them down. Well, obviously, when you give up 45 points in, in a game, there's obviously some struggles on the defensive side of the ball. What did you guys see this weekend? Whenever you give up 610 yards of offense uh, for the other team, that's a big-time problem. And it can be, you know, you can give up yards on defense and still be okay. And the Cardinals, in fact, have done that a lot of times this year. You look at that Army game, Ball State gave up a lot of yards, but won the game very easily. The big problem for me is that 11 for 15 on third down for Western Michigan. That's simply unacceptable. You can't allow a team to convert over two two-thirds of their third downs and even expect to be in the game, which they were for most of it, which is a little bit surprising. There is one positive, though, you take out of this. Four turnovers for the defense, and that's a team high, and that's uh, the bright spot, I guess, you bring in to this next game against Eastern Michigan. Well, for me, when you watch these two teams play, it was very obvious that the more veteran team was Western Michigan. A lot of seniors across the board. Coach Lembo very impressed with that. Um, you look at their quarterback, uh, Alex Carter, and their wide receiver, Jordan White. White's been there for six whole years. Uh, but they, the second Secondary problems just continued, and that was really apparent. Carter had a career day throwing on over 300 yards. Uh, White torched the defense, and I think the defense was so concerned about stopping Jordan White that they, they missed Robert Arnheim just burning them down the sidelines 
multiple times on what looked like the exact same play. So secondary problems still hanging around for this Ball State team. They really need to fix that because they're facing some pretty good wide receivers heading down the stretch. Well, at least the offense was kind of able to keep them in the game. They had a ton of offense, obviously not enough for the win, but there were some bright points out of this game that kind of surprised us. And the big ones, Barrington Scott, he comes out seven yards per carry and 105 uh, yards rushing. That's his best game of the season, including the IU game where he, he kind of broke out and showed what he can do. And I think a lot of that's the fact that I think Juwan Edwards had started taking a step or two ahead of him. And Barrington Scott had been hurt, but he kind of put a chip on his shoulder, came out and practiced, practiced really hard. Coach Limbo had said he had a good last couple weeks in practice and showed that this can be a two-man uh, offense for the running game. And, and Keith Wenning really statistically, at least, had a good game as well. Yeah, and when you talk about having a great running game, that helps out the passing game. Western Michigan had to be so concerned about guarding against Juwan Edwards or uh, Barrington Scott that Keith Wenning was able to have time in the pocket. He was able to pick apart the defense where he had the throws. And uh, I really saw him grow in his poise for the clutch situation. You look at going into halftime, Ball State down 21 points. Two minutes left, and the offense was able to score twice. Keith Wenning, just masterful. Even on that last drive, able to march the Cardinals down to the red zone. So we saw a little bit of growth out of Keith Wenning, and uh, that's one, another positive you can take out. And ironically enough, Barrington Scott, this deep into the season, just got his first touchdown. That's the first running back besides Jawan Edwards to finally have a, a touchdown for the Cardinals. Now stick on the offensive side of the ball as we saw a lot of gutsy and a little more aggressive play calling from Coach Lumbo than we've seen in the past. Yeah, the Cardinals went for it on fourth down three times in this game, which is something that they had done very rarely before that. And really the only gutsy call, if you will, that Coach Lumbo had made all year was the fake pun a couple weeks ago that worked successfully. And, and, and while most of these fourth downs didn't work, they did get a touchdown, which kept them in the game. The old adage is you take the points in the first half and maybe you try that stuff in the second half. But the other adage is you don't beat Western Michigan kicking field goals. And I think that's the kind of uh, emphasis that Coach Lembo wanted to say in his offense that we're going to need to score seven most of the times down the field to have a chance. They put a pretty good effort forthcoming, but not a good enough one. And what I love about this call by Coach Lembo is it shows his team that they're going for the win right now. They don't want to tie. They don't want to cover the spread or make a good showing. They want the win. You do that in the first half, show confidence in your quarterback, in your offense. I think that translates to more wins down the road because we've seen it time and time again. Keith Wenning, a guy, if you rattle him a little bit, he loses his confidence. Coach Lamba showing he has all the confidence in the world in his sophomore quarterback. A lot of confidence when you have him throw the ball 50 times. That was his high for, uh, for the season. Uh, be a little surprised if he threw that much this weekend, but uh, you never know. Uh, it was a little bit of a light weekend in the MAC for uh, Ball State and the rest of the, the teams in the MAC. But let's go ahead and take a look at some of the scores from around the MAC presented by Fox College Sports. And we start with an East-West matchup. Central Michigan by one over Akron. A bit of an odd score there, but it ended up being a close game. Yeah, Central Michigan got out to a big lead in this one, and Akron crawled back and almost came back for a second straight crushing defeat for Central Michigan. And then Bowling Green and Kent State. Are you kidding me? Bowling Green just beat Temple, and they lose by 12 to Kent State. If you can figure out the Mac East, uh, please tell me the formula, because I'm done trying to figure it out. And then once again, Miami puts up 41 on Buffalo, and a Buffalo team that seemed to be in a lot of close games. They almost beat Northern last week. They were an extra point away from sending Northern Illinois to overtime and then they lay an egg against Miami. Again, if, if you got the formula, don't just send it to Chris, send it to me too. Yeah, so Northern Illinois and Toledo on Tuesday night. Yeah, that's that's not a basketball score. That's a football score, isn't it, Chris? Oh my, this was a complete shootout by the definition. Each team in a couple plays scoring at will. A real treat to watch, but Ball State fans got to be getting a little nervous for both those games. Yeah, that game included 17 total touchdowns and a little bit of an interesting fact on that one. The uh, Toledo basketball team failed to score over 60 points in 20 games all of last year. So hey, the football team uh, definitely got there. Let's check out some of the standings. Uh, in the match, we'll start on the east side. Temple's still up there at the top uh, and kind of bump, bunched up there with Ohio. They're going to be playing this coming week. Yeah, and, and that'll be a big game for those two teams. If Ohio can win it, all of a sudden they're back in the driver's seat. Well, let's look at some of those top two teams, Northern and Toledo, and kind of the scenario playing out down the stretch of the season here. We'll start with Northern, Pat. There are three games to go. What do you think they're looking like setting up at the end of the year? Well, they struggled a lot this year, and surprisingly now with this victory, a little bit of a shocker over Toledo. They're in the driver's seat. Bowling Green, Ball State, Eastern Michigan, that might be uh, the easiest schedule out of any of the, the four or five MAC teams, MAC West teams really competing for this one. Northern Illinois, they're in the driver's seat. They win out, it's their MAC West, and they're headed to the title game. So 
I like uh, odds on Northern Illinois, I think. Chris Toledo uh, over there. Ball State at the very end of their schedule here at Schumann Stadium. Should be a very good one. Might be a big impact uh, on the way things shake out at the very end of the year. The remaining games on this Toledo schedule might be uh, a little tougher than you originally think. you got Western Michigan, Central Michigan, and then Ball State. This is a Central team that beat up on Northern Illinois. A Western team that we've seen is very potent in Ball State. they still got a little fight in them at the end of the year. So. Toledo might have a tougher time winning out than a lot of people may think. All right, well, it's time for the Miked Up segment of the week. You guys get a treat this week. He's one of the most uh, spontaneous, one of the fun, the fun guys on the team. He's a coach once again, the defensive coordinator, Jay Bateman. Set, go. Really good, really good, really good. Not bad, right? Here we go. Your coaching defense is a little bit different. You know, in my coaching philosophy, we're gonna try to be aggressive. I like having fun. I like guys that have fun. And, uh, you know, just to come out here and, and really be an aggressive attacking unit and, and coach our guys that same way. Square on me right, bang, I'm going to come inside. Same foot, same shoulder. Set, go, go, go. If they're going to push you past you, you're going to make the tackle. Good, right, good, right there, good. Jog it back, jog it back. Here we go, really good, really good. Pretty good, get the trash cans out here for me on the hop. Get the trash cans out here on the hop. Here we go, here we go. What's going to happen, right? If you do that, what's, he's, that thing's going to come right downhill on us, right? Last one, give me this one. It's the hardest one. Get a read here, Cody. Go! Good, Zach. Two wide. Look at this. See what I mean? One more. One more real quick. Get down in the stance for me, two guards. All right. You got to see it and then feel it and get going. You with me? Everybody feel good about that? All right, last one. We're going to... Let's talk about the defense a little bit more in depth now and how they've kind of grown throughout the year. Uh, last in overall defense, but there are some bright points that you can take out from, from game to game. Well, I think the, the biggest bright point is they're really starting to get turnovers, and that's something they struggled with early in the year. During their victories, they'd go a game without turning the ball over, but they also wouldn't get a turnover. And last week against Western Michigan, while the defense really struggled, they got four turnovers. We saw plenty of turnovers in that Central Michigan game, plenty of turnovers in the Ohio game. What makes this kind of frustrating is they've got so so many individually good players, and at times they can look so good. Look at the second half against uh, Central Michigan, the first half against Army. It was a totally different unit than we saw against Western Michigan, but I think where they've really been struggling is against that spread offense with a really good quarterback. And part of that is because their defensive line just hasn't been able to get any pressure on opposing quarterbacks. You look at the win against IU, it was all about the defensive line, the linebackers, rushing Ed Wright Baker and not allowing him to sit in the pocket and make good decisions. You look at their losses against Oklahoma South Florida, no pressure. The quarterback's able to sit back there all day and pick apart defenses. And the, the defensive line, it's, it's weird that they've just disappeared like this. However, you look at one positive of this defense is they're very young. You got a lot of guys coming back next year, a lot of talent coming back, and maybe some upgrades at the defensive line. So good things coming in the future. Well, I think you also look at this weekend. Yeah, they gave up a lot of yards, but when you force four turnovers in the secondary, I mean, the offense does have to produce at some point. So I'd say the defense, like Pat said, with the turnovers are definitely uh, improving. One of those players that had an interception this weekend was Aaron Morris. Also, uh, Jason Pinkston, uh, Travis Freeman, and Toriel Gibson, they all share the field, but they also share a special connection from back home. Chris Rankel and Ben Wagner have more on the story. For Ball State football fans, their household names. For players who symbolize hard work, passion, and attitude. Although each has had a different path to Ball State, their journeys all started at the same place. Growing up in Cleveland, you know, uh, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of stuff going on in Cleveland. It was rough sometimes, but it was good growing up. I mean, I stayed outside of Cleveland, so I really wasn't uh, down by Glenville. It's not good at all. It's bad gangs, gang violence, you know, right, selling drugs. Anything that I can latch on to, to getting out of this area, is what I was looking for. And um, football, football gave me that opportunity. Every August, millions across Northeast Ohio turn their attention to the biggest sport in the state. For the Glenville Tar Blooders, football was so much more than just a game. A lot of people always ask me, what is a Tar Blooder? Tar Blooder means to be a hardcore. You work till you pass out. There's a lot of high expectations. You sweat till it's blood. When you want to quit, just think about the people before us. Ted Ginn, Troy Smith, that's Glenville. One of the best teams in the state. Anything's possible. You play for something bigger than yourself. It means a lot. Coach Ginn is truly heaven sent, I believe. Um, anytime, anytime you pit the success 
of other individuals before your success. That's, that's remarkable if you ask me. Um, that's like a father to me. I never had no father figure growing up. My mother was my mother and father, but he, Coach Ginn, was my father at the time because he kept me out of trouble, kept me in class, and kept me on the right track. He's all about life before football. I mean, he cares about football, but he's all about getting you into college so you can um, take care of your family one day, have money one day, so you don't have to struggle. He's always looking to help out the players in any way, shape, or form, like on the field, off the field, mostly off the field, because he want to uh, get our life going in the right direction. Coming from Glenville just helped me a lot, man, a lot. You know, it helped me see everything clear now. It helped me out a lot because it made me appreciate everything. Coming from, uh, Glenville and everything, coming from the neighborhood, everybody don't get that chance to go to college. Glenville saved my life. Coach Ginn saved my life. Um, I don't know where I'd be without him, honestly. Me and Toriel were great, good friends in high school. So when, when Ball State came up, I had no problem with it because it was nothing but positive things coming from the Ball State area. So I said, I mean, why not? Well, uh, Travis, Travis Freeman, and uh, Tori Gibson, and uh, Jackson Kingston, I knew they were here. And for some reason, I just couldn't get Boss State on my head. And I had, I had a couple of other BCS offers also, but for some, Boss State, it just wouldn't leave my head. And I guess that was just meant for me to just be here. I know Cincinnati had offered me, uh, Michigan was talking to me, but uh, I wanted to go to school and play with uh, Travis and uh, Tori L, so we had to get that pipeline going. It just feels so good that you're playing with your team again. Sometimes I wish I was on D because that's where they all at and I miss it so much. It's going to be just like high school. I mean, I, if I know the guy next to me is, is, uh, is going to make it do his job and the guy on the right of me is going to do his job, I should, be, I should be able to do my job even better. It's, it's, it's unbelievable to me sometimes. Because sometimes I look to him and I'm like, wow, like, we actually went to the same college. You're talking about guys. You're talking about coming from a community where nothing positive is even happening. And we're all in school getting our education and planning and doing the things that we love. Well, it's time once again for the Watch Chirpin segment of the show. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Third Down Chirp and tweet us a question every week about Ball State football. You might win a chance to get a free Papa John's pizza this week. We have a question from Daniel Ift. Yes, the Daniel Ift. He's at Toledo right now as a grad assistant coaching. But he asked, Temple was 8-4 and four last season, and they failed to make a bowl game. How many teams will receive a bowl bid this season? First off, uh, I'm pretty sure that's highway robbery that Temple didn't get a bowl last year. Highway <laughs> robbery is an understatement. To go 8-4 and four and beat Connecticut, who played in the Big East uh, bowl game, is ridiculous. But I think the MAC is going to get four bowl teams this year, and I think it's going to be Temple. I think it's going to be Toledo. I think it's going to be Northern Illinois. Then there's kind of that wild card for the fourth, where Western Michigan, Ball State, and Eastern Michigan are kind of playing for that fourth spot. And right now, Western Michigan, they've got the leg up since they beat Ball State last week, tied in the win-loss margin, uh, but they've got, they end the season with Miami and Akron, which will be uh, probably two victories. So if I had to pick, I'd say Western Michigan, but I uh, would love to see the cards go bull to say the least. Well, this is an interesting question because you look at a lot of the recruiting sites and other college football sites around, Rivals.com had seven MAC teams going to a bowl. I don't know where they got that because I don't think 17 MAC teams are going to a bowl. I'm going to say five. And I'm going to say Temple and Ohio out of the east, and then Western, Toledo, and Northern Illinois out of the west. I think those are solid teams all across the board. They all deserve to go bowling. Ball State, just too tough of a schedule at the end of the year. I think it would probably be somewhere around four as well. Like Pat said, that fourth one will probably be the wild card, and especially based on the past, how Temple got left out of an eight and four uh, season. All right, well, the Cardinals hit the road once again this week to Michigan, but this time to Ypsilanti. And the Cardinals have had success there, but they've won five out of the last six in this whole relationship with Eastern Michigan. But the last one, it was a bad date as the Cardinals lost a heartbreaker here at Schumann Stadium. This week they'll face a team that's well-rested as Eastern's come off a bye week after they beat Western Michigan 14 to 10. They play an offense that is very run heavy and a defense that is very stingy and much improved. Let's hear from some of the players this week in practice on the game plan coming into this weekend. Uh, we need to start better because usually we have a slow start which gets us behind, but we also need to finish and just go 100% each play and keep the offense on the field. Uh, well, it's, it's, 
it's very simple game plan. I mean, if, on both sides of the ball. I mean, for them, offensively, they don't do a lot. But what they do, they do well. So on defense, I mean, you just got to do your job every single play, be physical, and we'll be okay. This win means everything to us. We have to get it. There is no losing this game. It, only make, it makes us bowl eligible, but also once um, game closer to the MAC championship. Every, every, every game counts at this point, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so um, at this point, we have to treat it like a playoff. So um, each, each battle is considered a playoff game or championship game at that moment. Well, like I said, Eastern with that run-heavy offense, they barely throw for over 100 yards a game. But the Cardinals do seem like they're better against the run. They've been better against the run at least this year. But, you know, this is an Eastern Michigan team that's really interesting. They haven't gone over 500 since the mid-90s. And finally, they've got kind of a quarterback-running back duo. Green their tailback, Alex Gillette their quarterback, and they love to run the football. And Gillette, he's a mobile quarterback. And if you remember the game against Eastern Michigan last year, he really tore Ball State apart in the second half in that big comeback overtime victory. He's the guy to watch. And not only for his running ability, but you got to think with how bad Ball State's secondary has been all year, that Eastern Michigan is going to take some shots in the passing game. And why wouldn't you? Secondary has been banged up, hasn't been performing well, and Ball State really isn't expecting it. But, Pat, you're absolutely right. They have to stop Gillette, and part of that falls on the defensive line. Like I said before, got to be able to contain him and get pressure on him. Don't let him sit back there all day and pick you apart. And Eastern can control the clock a big deal with, with that running offense. So it seems like the Cardinals are really going to have to capitalize on their opportunities this week. Uh, so how important will that be for them? It's big. It's very big because Eastern Michigan's best defense is their offense. It's their offense controlling the football, and that's how they held Western Michigan to just 10 points. It's unbelievable to think that the team that just put up 45 on Ball State was held to 10 by Eastern Michigan nonetheless, but they put up a great performance, and when you run the ball as much as they do, it's sort of like Army. Your possessions are going to be limited, so you have to make each one count. Ball State did that against Army. They didn't necessarily do that against Western Michigan, although it wasn't bad, but Keith Wenning, I don't think he can afford to have those two interceptions despite the fact that he played pretty well otherwise uh, last week. And you just said Pete Lumbo's favorite buzzword, turnovers. <laughs> when Ball State doesn't turn the ball over, they win football games. It's a proven formula. It's happened all year. Ball State has to make the most of their possessions. They cannot turn the ball over. And then on the opposite end, they're going to have to get some of those timely turnovers like they did against Western Michigan and Ohio force the fumble when that guy isn't going down, refuses to go down, strip that football out, get it back for your offense, but you're going to have to make the most of every single play. Is this Eastern Michigan team the best team in Michigan, in, in the MAC, not just Michigan, but in the MAC? Are they the best team, and how do the Cardinals match up with them compared to Central and Western? Well, they make a pretty darn case for it, especially beating Western Michigan just two weeks ago. I think it's, it's a case where if Western Michigan and Eastern Michigan play ten times, Western Michigan probably wins eight, but Eastern Michigan came into that game last week. They were ready for them and uh, and Western was not ready for Eastern Michigan. I think they expected the Eastern Michigan of old and they really came out and got a big late victory against Western. But you know uh, what the win really means is I think the loser of this game kind of falls back, kind of falls out of that bull talk, kind of falls out of obviously of any Mac West title talk. The loser of this game I think eliminates Ball State or Eastern Michigan in the bull talk. I completely agree and as for which team is the best, I, I really have no idea. These teams have been battling it out all year. It's really been fun to watch, but each team brings something unique. Eastern Michigan, really more of a run style, run only kind of offense. The other two Michigans are more aired out, pass happy offenses. So Eastern Michigan provides a unique uh, challenge for Ball State, but I think you know facing a team like Army who runs in every play, that's going to help you out now in this game because I mean you're ready for it. You're, you're pleading the fifth then. You're not picking. You're not picking one. I'm not picking one. <laughs> I'm not picking one. All right. Well, you got to pick one here. Player of the game for you guys. We'll start with Pat. Just two years ago, Ball State went to Eastern Michigan, completed one pass, oh, and won the football <laughs> game. 500 yards rushing. They had a 300-yard rusher, Michael Lewis, a 200-yard rusher in Corey Sykes. Broke an NCAA record. It's just two years ago. My player to watch is Jawan Edwards. Obviously, the tail, one of the two tailbacks for the Cardinals. I think it's important that he has a big game because for whatever reason, coming off that performance then last year, Ball State couldn't run uh, really worth a darn. And so now I think if they can come back, go into Eastern Michigan, establish that running game like they did, obviously Keith Wenning is going to complete more than one pass. I'm going to have to go on the defensive side of the ball. Nathan Ali, I said it all show long, this defensive line really needs to play a lot better if they want a chance to win these last three games. Nathan Ali, he had a great start to this season, a couple sacks against IU, and he's really fallen off the deep end from there. It's time for Nathan Ali and the rest of the defensive line to pick it up 
and start getting pressure on those quarterbacks. I'll stay on the defensive side of the ball as well. I'll go with Travis Freeman slash basically the whole linebacking core because of that run defense, but also to have that QB spy on uh, Gillette when he you know can scramble, I think the linebackers really have to be ready. They had a ton of tackles last week, so I think Travis Freeman and the whole defensive linebacking core really has to step up uh, defensively, maybe cause some turnovers as well and force some fumbles getting that ball out of there. Well, that will do it for us here at a very dark Schumann Stadium, uh, but make sure you tune in every Thursday at 3 o'clock online. Also, Fox College Sports, Comcast, and WIPB will air us as well. If you can't make it out to the game uh, this weekend, don't forget SportsLink Radio will be broadcasting on 91.3 WCRD and WCRD.net. That's it, guys. Pat and Chris, thanks once again. I'm Kyle Binder. We'll see you guys next week.